Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Kudenska. I'm from the University of Oxford. And this is the second part of um, my series on profiling invariance of free bicyclic groups, which is part of the nearly carbon neutral geometric topology conference. So everything I'm about to say in this talk is joint work with Sam Hughes, also at Oxford. Okay, so if you take your mind back to um, the previous talk, we talked about this notion of almost profinite rigidity of groups. So we assumed our groups to be residually finite, finely generated. Then we said that a group is almost profinely rigid if its profinite genus is finite. Well, this profinite genus was exactly the set of all finitely generated residually finite groups whose profinite completion is isomorphic to that of G. So now we would like to kind of broaden this notion a little bit. So let's see be a class of finally generates residually finite groups, and suppose G is a member of this class. We say G is almost profoundly rigid, but only relative to this class, if the relative profinite genus is finite, where the relative profinite genus now is just the profinite genus intersected with this class C. So in other words, G is profoundly rigid, almost profoundly rigid relative to C, if um, within this class curly C, um, there are only finitely many elements whose profinite completion is isomorphic to that of G. So the, there is usually a strategy that one follows um, to, in order to show these relative profinite rigidity to results. And that is, um, first of all, to prove that various properties of the groups in this class C are invariants of the profinite completion. And once you have this, you then show that these profinite invariants established in, in the first part narrow down the groups in curly C to a finite set of possibilities. So what are the groups that we're interested in? I'm, I'm going to say a group is free bicyclic if it fits into this short exact sequence with a finite rank free group on the left and this infinite cyclic group on the right. Um, any such short exact sequence actually splits. And so G can be expressed as um, a semi-direct product of a finely generated free group by the integers. Now, uh, this little phi um, symbol uh, next to the semi-direct product symbol is um, the outer automorphism of Fn, which is induced by the action of some lift of a generator Z in G. We call this phi the monotomy associated with the splitting, um, and the splitting itself um, has this character, this map to Z associated to it, which is this alpha. And just for those who don't know, out of, of Fn is just a group of all automorphisms of Fn modulo the inner guys, so the ones that just act by conjugation by a fixed element. So it turns out that this, um, this splitting, the semi-direct product splitting, is only well-defined up to multiplication by these inner automorphisms. And this is why we look at elements of out of Fn instead of the elements of um, ought. OK, so um, now that we've introduced the class of groups we're interested in, we'd like to talk about the uh, various dynamical properties of these, um, or, well, various properties of the free bicyclic groups, which in turn arise as dynamical properties of the elements of um, out of Fn. So first of all, an element is said to be ateroidal if it does not act periodically on um, non-trivial, here I should have said, non-trivial um, conjugacy classes of elements in Fn. So in other words, we don't, there does not exist a non-trivial element of, um, in Fn, such that some power of this automorphism maps this element to its conjugate. Now, what's the relation between this and free bisected groups? Well, it's, it's really given very nicely by this theorem of Brinkman, which essentially says that a free bisected group is what's known as chrome of hyperbolic, exactly when this out automorphism is atorodal. Now, maybe let's let's see an example of, um, of what these guys look like or what they don't look like actually. Um, so the following automorphism of F2 represents a non atorodal element of the out automorphism group. So I fixed a free basis of F2, A, B, and I'm mapping A to B and B to B, A inverse. Um, 
And now it turns out that if I look at what happens to this commutator BA inverse B inverse A, this guy is actually just mapped to itself. Okay, so it's it's actually being fixed. And um, kind of an interesting fact is that um, no outer automorphism of F two is a toroidal, so you you are always fixing some um, something of course some commutator. So let's let's talk about another property, another dynamical property, which is the notion of irreducibility. So we say an uh, element of out of F F n is irreducible if there does not exist a splitting of the free group um, as such, where these, so these AIs are non-trivial proper free factors, B could be trivial, we don't know, and um, phi maps AI to a conjugate of AI plus one. And then once you get to the end, you do mod M, so you go back around to A1. Okay, so you're reducible if there exists such a free splitting on, on upon which phi acts in such a way. So let's see an example of this. Um, so the example from the previous slide is actually irreducible. So it's very interesting. We saw that it's not a toroidal. There exists some element which is being preserved actually, but this element can never form a, form a part of a free basis. So this is why this, this guy is actually irreducible. That doesn't mess up reducibility for you. Whereas the following automorphism represents a reducible element of out of F3. This is um, this map psi maps. Um, if I choose this free basis of um, F of three, which is just given by A, B, and C, I'm mapping A to B, B to B, A, and C to C, B. And you can see that this free factor that's generated by A and B um, is being preserved in this case. Okay, so we've talked about um, a toroidal, we've talked about reducible, and now we would like to introduce another dynamical property, which essentially measures how fast elements grow under um, this automorphism. Okay, so we're gonna fix some, um, I should have said here, free um, finite generating set of Fn. So some um, basis of, um, with size of size n. Um, then we write um, this norm of an element with respect to x to just be the length of the shortest element in, the, in its conjugacy class with respect to this finite generating set x. Okay, so now let us just assume for now that our automorphism is irreducible. Turns out that you can really um, extend all of this theory to general automorphisms, but just for the sake of privacy, we're gonna um, assume reducibility. Um, fix some element of the free group C, then the homotopical stretch factor of this out automorphism is just defined to be the exponential growth rate of this element um, under the iterates of this out automorphism. So this is exactly what this formula is measuring, this exponential growth rate. And it turns out that as long as this non-trivial, uh, as long as this element C was non-trivial, I will get the same result. So it's independent of this C, um, and it's also independent of, the, of this um, finite generating set that I started with, as long as it's a free basis. Okay, and now here's a lemma that will kind of work towards our almost profinite rigidity. Um, for a given N and a given constant K greater or equal to one, it turns out that there are at most finitely many outer automorphisms of Fn whose homotopical stretch factor is bounded above by k. Okay, so th this is very this is very useful. This will really give us our um, finite relative genus. Great. So I'm ready to state one of our main results. So given an outer automorphism, I'm going to write the ab to denote the induced element of GLNZ. Okay, so it's just once if I have an out automorphism of Fn, this induces a map of the free organization, and it turns out this is an automorphism. Um, now, let G be a free bisecular group, and I'm going to also assume um, that the first Betty number of G is equal to one. Okay, so this means that the rank of the free organization is equal to one. It also means that. Um, if I looked at the possible um, epimorphisms onto Z of G, there are only two. 
So there's, um, there are only two possible ways of fitting G into a short exact sequence, like we saw on the um, definition of free bicyclic group slide. And so somehow all of this, this free bicyclic structure is really well defined um, up, to, up to taking a inverse of this monodromy. In particular, the, this rank of the free group is well defined. It's always N for this given free bisexual group. Great. Then the following are profinite invariants. So when I say profinite invariant, I really mean that any group um, H, which is free bicyclic and whose profinite completion is isomorphic to that of G, will also satisfy or have the same properties or have, have exactly these. So first of all, the rank N of the fiber. So the rank of this free group N will be the same. Second of all, um, the characteristic polynomial of this induced automorphism of Z to the N. So this induced element of GLN Z. So for any two free bicyclic groups, these characteristic polynomials, as long as the profinite completions are isomorphic, the characteristic polynomials will essentially be the same. And then finally, we can deduce whether um, G is hyperbolic or not from its finite completion. So um, re recall this is to do with whether this out automorphism is ateroidal or not. So we can really see this in the finite completion. Moreover, um, if G satisfies the slightly technical condition of um, called conjugacy separability, and this actually holds um, in particular if G is hyperbolic. So you can think just like, okay, if G is hyperbolic, then um, the maximal stretch factors of phi and phi inverse are profinite invariants. Okay, so these exactly these exponential growth rates, um, which by the way, can be different for phi and phi inverse. They're not necessarily the same, but as a tuple, this will be a profinite invariant of the group G. Great, so, um, this leads me to our actual main theorem. So let me just say group uh, free bicycle groups are reducible if for some, and actually it's true that if it's for some, then it's for any um, free bicyclic splitting, the corresponding monotremy will be an irreducible out automorphism. Now, what we managed to prove with this sum was that um, if G is an irreducible free bicyclic group with first body number equal to one, then G is almost profoundly rigid amongst the class of all irreducible free bicyclic groups. Okay, so you I pick out any other irreducible free bicyclic group from the GASA, um, and it turns out to have the same isomorphic profile completion as G, then there can only be finitely many guys. Right, so that is one of our theorems. I guess maybe the main thing that stands out here is the fact that this class of free bicyclic groups that we're restricting to, um, it's not all free bicyclic groups, it's just the irreducible ones. Okay, so we can only say things as long as we know that both the groups are irreducible. Now we can overcome this um, with a little simple trick, no trick, well, um, and this is to do with randomness, with genericity. Um, how does this work? Well, I'm going to fix n, and again, I'm going to fix a finite generating set of out of fn, which is a finely generated group. And same as before, um, given some out automorphism, um, I'm going to use this norm notation to denote the shortest length of a word. Um, and here I really mean cyclically reduced. So, I, in fact, also the shortest length of the um, representative of a conjugacy class of this element phi. Um, in out of a fan with respect to this uh, finite generating set S. So very, very similar to in the definition of growth for the um, lengths of elements in Fn. But now we're looking at elements in out of a fan. Okay, and now I'm going to define this set um, U of K to be all three bicyclic groups which admit a splitting like this, Fn, um, Fn by Z, where the corresponding monotromy has length bounded above by K. Okay, so it turns out this is a finite set um, and um, it's well defined and this is what it is. Now, we want to be able to kind of say something holds for a generic or for a random free bicyclic group and to do so, we need a model. And this, 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 this is exactly the, the model that we'll be using. So uh, we'll say a property P holds for a generic free bicyclic group 
if the ratio of the free bicyclic groups with property P inside the set UK um, to the size of the set itself tends to one as K tends to infinity. Okay, so think about what this means. Um, the ratio of the free bicyclic groups which have this property P um, amongst all free bicyclic groups tends to one as K tends to infinity, where K is this kind of this length, this measure, measuring the length of these monotremies. Okay, so now we were able to prove with Sam the following. Um, a generic free bicyclic group is almost profoundly rigid amongst the class of all free bicyclic groups. Okay, so let me finish by saying kind of how, how did we manage to achieve this, uh, what looks like a much stronger theorem than the one on the previous slide um, with perhaps a little less work actually. Um, so again, we need to prove that certain thing is a certain property is a finite invariant. And um, in order to prove this gener genericity, um, we'll need to prove that this property itself is generic. Um, or that the generic free bisector group has this property. Okay, so what is this? What is this generic property that we're interested in? It, it will be a strengthening of a reducibility. So we say an, an element of out of n is super irreducible if um, the induced map on the free organization does not preserve a non-trivial proper subspace of Rn. So here, remember, this is technically an element of GLN Z, so it's acting on Z to the n, but I'm just tensoring with R um, to, get, to get it to act on this vector space R to the n. So equivalently, um, what this means is that the characteristic polynomial of this induced, you know, this matrix essentially is irreducible. So now you just need to collect three facts about super reducibility in order to deduce the theorem that we proved with Sam. So fact number one, super reducible, as I said, it's stronger than irreducible. It implies that um, you're irreducible. So if you're super reducible, then you're irreducible and then you can use the result, our results um, that prove these things for irreducible free bicyclic groups. Second of all, um, super irreducibility is in fact a, an invariant of the profinite completion. Um, and this is just because the characteristic polynomial was one of these uh, in profinite properties um, that we saw before. Um, now, this is in stark contrast to irreducibility, where we actually don't know if, if this is a profinite invariant. So super irreducibility, we know it's a profinite invariant, irreducibility, we have no idea. And then finally, super reducibility is generic. So now you can combine these three facts to say, okay, if I have a super reducible free bicyclic groups, um, or if I have a generic free bicyclic group, this generic free bicyclic group is super reducible. It turns out that it actually also has first body number equal to one. Um, and then any element in the profinite genus of this super reducible free bicyclic group will also be super reducible irreducible and therefore irreducible. And then we can um, we can apply our result uh, with Sam from a couple of slides ago to then say that um, this guy is almost profoundly rigid. Thank you. <laughs>